morning, Cornerstone. Justin Key with you, and it's offering time. Glad you guys are with us. All right, in Deuteronomy 14, 23, it says, Bring the tithe to the designated place of worship. That's here at Cornerstone. Aren't you glad to be a part of this church? I love this church. Now, we got four ways to give. You can go to www.cornerstoneofadrian.com. You can always give on the Church Center app or text GIVE to 84321. Or you can mail a check to P.O. Box 247, Onstead, Michigan 49265. Remember, we will come out on top of this. We all pay tithe and we have tithers rights, right? Lord, I thank you, Lord, for this message, and I pray you bless everybody in the sound of my voice, Lord, that no matter what it looks like, Lord, we are come out on top. In Jesus' name, amen. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin, my Jesus is calling. Have you come?
was bought with the precious blood of oh, Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide for me. there today and you're thinking those thoughts as well man pastor bill how am i supposed to come to the altar we're streaming today there's no altars for me to come to listen you don't need to come necessarily inside this physical building to receive jesus christ as lord this is something you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth and jesus christ is king jesus christ is now lord on, on of your life and your name is wrote in the lamb's book of life angels in heaven are rejoicing you need to go over to romans chapter 10 read verse 9 and 10 if you don't know jesus christ as lord you need to you need today to come to the altar even if it's at your house even if it's beside your bed right there beside the couch lay down on the floor in the middle of your living room if that's what you got to do give your heart to jesus if you're not sure about your eternal destination you're not sure if you would die today if you would go to heaven we're giving you the opportunity hey we're trying to lead you listen this is what the bible says because we were sinners, we were bound for hell. But Jesus Christ came and paid the price. He died for us once and for all so that you could live with him forever. Don't let that gift lay there in vain. Amen? Do it now. unthinkable, the shift that showed our frailty. Nonetheless, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome it. We are separated. We are isolated. And in this world, we have trouble. Nonetheless, we take heart because Jesus has overcome the world. We are conflicted and frustrated, weary too. But nonetheless, those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. We are down but not out, sidelined but still in the game. 
We fight for our families, we hold on to love, we strive for kindness, but the hard times get harder. Nonetheless, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. We walk through adversity. We are sons and daughters of the Most High. We know to whom we belong and we know where our hope lies. For he is the first and the last, the Alpha and Omega, the one who is and the one who is to come. It looks bleak, they say it's grim, there's a lot to fear, but none the less. We are strong. We are courageous. We are the church. Good morning, Cornerstone. Man, we are excited that you're with us today. Praise God for another glorious day living in the kingdom. I'm telling you, better is one day in God's house than a thousand elsewhere. Aren't you glad to be part of the kingdom this morning? If you don't have that joy, hey, get in the word of God and figure out all the great things that Jesus Christ did for you. You have a reason to rejoice this morning. It's time to get up with a smile on your face. It's time to, to, to have some expectation about today. Today's the day the Lord has made. Let's rejoice and be glad in all of his goodness. Amen. Listen, we got a really, really, really good guest speaker that's with us this morning. Now this is a live stream. We're, we're literally pulling this stream all the way from Midland, Michigan this morning. So this is not pre-recorded. This is a live service. Just like if we had a guest minister standing in the building this morning, we, are, we have a guest minister with us morning, this morning. I'm going to bring him in in just a second, but I want to encourage you. If you're on Facebook right now, I'm encouraging you to go ahead and click that like button. Go ahead and like this video. Go ahead and like our page if you haven't already so that you can be following all the latest updates and everything that we're doing. Then I'm going to ask you if you would share this post, this video that you're seeing right now. Go ahead and click share. Make that thing available so all your friends see it so we can spread this thing out even a little bit further. Check in is another thing that you can do on Facebook. Go ahead and click that check in button. It's going to say, uh, you, you know, you put your put in, put in the address, look for Cornerstone Community Church, and you can actually click, check into the building even if you're not standing here today. You are part of our service this morning. So go ahead and check into that service. All of these things, doing all of these things is going to push that stream out further and further so we can reach more and more people with the good news that Jesus Christ is alive and we don't have to be bound for hell anymore. Aren't you glad? Some other things I want you to do is go to www.cornerstoneofadrian.com. Check out all the stuff that we have available there. Uh, there's many different things, different resources available. You can give there, of course. You can, there's a prayer request tab there. You can check out our YouTube page, which is up, updated two or three times a week, sometimes four or five times a week. Go ahead and do that. Um, you know, in Ephesians 4, it says that Jesus Christ himself has given gifts to the body of Christ for our perfecting. Aren't you glad that we have a God that loves us? Maybe your love language this morning is gifts. Now, listen, we all, have, we all love to get gifts. Uh, do we not? H hello. Well, listen, we all celebrate Christmas. Probably that's in the sound of my voice. Uh, so listen, we all love getting gifts. This morning I have a gift. According to Ephesians 4, Jesus Christ himself has given us apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers for the equipping of the saints. So, so listen, here's another thing to rejoice about this morning. Your heavenly father loves you so much that he has sent gifts into the body of Christ to minister to you, to speak life to you, to encourage you, to equip you for the work of ministry. Aren't you glad that we serve a God who not only tells us to go do something, uh, you know, go into all the world and reach the, reach the lost. He also empowers us to do it with the power of the Holy Ghost and grace, but he also gives us instructors in our lives to help us equip us to get that thing done. Aren't you glad about that? We serve a great and mighty God. So with that being said, that Jesus Christ gives us gifts this morning, we have a special guest with us who is a gift to the body of Christ. Reverend Ray Bench is with us this morning. So I'm going to turn this over to him and let him roll with it. But I'm telling you, you're going to be blessed with the word of God this morning. Amen. Hey, everybody. Ray Bench here, Many Waters. Um, kind of an unusual way to have church. But, you know, the Apostle Paul had to be inventive of the ways he did it, the underground church. And um, so we're going to do it today too. call you blessed today. Um, just to tell me, tell you a little bit about me. Um, I got born again in 1985. That's going to seem like a million years ago to a lot of you. And uh, some of you probably weren't even born yet. But that, that's all right. Um, I was newly saved, got filled with the Holy Spirit, fell in love with God and all that God was doing. And um, I'm home in my, well, at that time, I'm a college student, right? So I'm in my room by myself. I'm eating a peanut butter sandwich, peanut butter on toast. The, the toast is hot. The peanut butter's kind of melting off the edges. 
I got a big tall glass of milk, which in, in my day, that was prosperity, right? Minding my own business, reading my Bible, sitting on the floor, um, and the Holy Spirit comes in. I, I, I want to say out of nowhere, if I can say it that way. And he says to me, he said, I want you to teach. And, and I, I refused. I said, God, I'm not, I'm not going to teach. I don't know what to say. And it just went quiet, right? Just dead quiet. So the next day I went back and I said, okay, God, I'll teach if you'll send me to someone who can show me how. I don't want to say things that are wrong. I don't want to teach things that are wrong and then have to go back and correct it later on. So I spent literally from, that was in about 1985, 86. And I spent until 2004 studying, learning, letting the Lord work with me and preparing for this day just for what I'm doing right now. So the things that I'm gonna share with you aren't something I just got off the cuff. These are things I've lived now for decades and that's what I wanna share with you. Can you say amen? I want to talk to you a little bit, not just about the Ministry of Helps, because everybody's helping, I'm sure. Look at the church there with Pastor and all the worshipers and, and all of you. But I want to talk to you today about a thing I, called an, I call an anointed team. Let's look at some verses together, and then we'll study this for just a little bit. And um, we'll let the Bible do the heavy lifting, as I say it. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 18 says it this way. Um, it says, but now God has set the members, each one of them in the body, just as he pleased. Think about that for just a minute. God set you in the church, in the body of Christ, where it pleased him. Not you, not me. Maybe you think you should be elsewhere, but God didn't set you there. God set you where you are now. If there was a better place for you to be, he would have set you there. But he didn't. He put you where you are now. And then the Bible goes on in verse 24. It says, but God composed the body, having given greater honor to that which part, which lacks it, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. One member suffers and all suffer. And it goes on, verse 27 says this, it says, now you are the body of Christ and members individually, and God has appointed these in the church apostles, prophets, and it goes on to list the, the ministry of helps. I want to talk about that word compose. God composed the body for just a minute. A song isn't just one note over and over and over, middle C, over and over and over. A, a composition, a song is called a musical composition. It's the blending of all of the different notes that are working in the same harmony and syncopated with one another so that it blends into this beautiful song. That's the church. It isn't just your pastor over and over and over and over again. He need, it's a blending of anointings. It's a blending of calls. It's a blending of people that God uses, that he assembled this team together on purpose. And then everybody has a ministry or an anointing to help make that team go. Now that doesn't make you your own pastor, it gives you an anointing to come alongside of your pastor and to help make that ministry go. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Now, your pastor just shared Ephesians chapter 4. I'm always glad when people are led of the Spirit and they are given the same verses as me. I just wish God would give them to them after I've already preached. Hallelujah. So that that's all right. That's just everybody in the same flow. But he talked about gifts. Let's just talk about gifts for just a minute. Uh, Christmas gifts, like you mentioned, Pastor. Um, every Christmas, you know, we give gifts to our children. In our home, my wife is like the single most meticulous person in the world, which I am not. Whole nother discussion. I am not allowed to wrap the presents because they don't, they don't look right when I do them, right? My wife puts so much effort into them. And in seconds, my kids, they rip all the wrapping off, right? There's, they're just shredded. You can hardly find the kids under all the wrapping paper because the kids don't care about the wrapping paper. They want to know about the gift that's on the inside of it. I've discovered that sometimes in the body of Christ, we're worried about the wrapping paper way too much. My gift, I'm not going to open it because this person is that way or that person is this way. And it doesn't, it doesn't quote jive with what I, what I want. 
Uh, I love a phrase I got from my pastor, Dr. Barkley. He said, it took me a while to learn, but everybody isn't me. Everybody in the kingdom of God doesn't have Ray Bench's flavor. Everybody in the kingdom of God doesn't have Pastor Bill's flavor. But that doesn't make it wrong. It just makes it different. You might like the color of my house. You might not. But it doesn't matter. There's no sin one way or the other. And in the church, as long as we're not crossing the scriptures, there's some flexibility in there for us to all obey God. Amen. So whether it's music or the people in the nursery or whatever, we've got to learn that everybody is, isn't us. Everybody ain't us. You know, uh, uh, let me just pause for just a minute. I'm, I'm a simple guy. If you met me right now, you'd say that's the best dressed redneck I've ever seen in my life, right? That's, that's me. Um, if you're waiting for deep Hebrew and Greek words, you're going to have to wait for Pastor Bill to get a really smart speaker or Pastor Bill to come in and preach Greek and Hebrew because that's not me. I'm just, I'm me. I'm Ray Bench. I got wonderfully born again. And um, if God had made me preach, you'd never see me. Um, I can't, I don't want to go into all my testimony, but promise you, um, I'm a whole lot better with a shovel in a ditch than I am with a Bible. Hallelujah. That's my, that's my niche. But anyway, so hallelujah. <clears throat> but anyways, let's get back to gifts. What you have to do and what I have to do is get past the outer core of every person in the church and say, now what does, what is spiritual gift is inside of them that Jesus Christ put in them that helps me think about this for just a minute if you went home or you went out on your front doorstep and there's you know one of those old brown boxes wrapped that came from ups right the old grocery bag kind of stuff binder twine as we call it or cord string holding it together it's not fancy it's not pretty but on there is your address and the return address is warren buffett or Bill Gates, or whoever, whatever their return address is, I don't know. You know why you're going to open that package? Because of the resources that are available to the person who sent it to you. With one check, they could probably clear all the money you're going to need for however many years the rest of your life. Even though the wrapping on the package doesn't look precious. The sender has so many resources available to them that you're foolish not to open the package. When Jesus Christ put a gift inside of your pastor, Pastor Bill, because of the resources that are available to Jesus Christ, which is what? Everything. Everything you're ever going to need to know in life. Everything that's going to prepare you for the next thing to hit your life. What your faith will need to be. In that spiritual gift that's inside of the man of God that's in front of you, if you'll go focus on that, then God will have answers for you for what you need. That's his promise. He gave gifts unto men. What? For the building up of the body of Christ. Why? So that we might know our ministry in our place. Now, those thoughts in mind, I want to go with, with me if you would, or turn with me if you would. This is one of my favorite stories ever in the scripture. And I just want to read to you out of Numbers chapter 11. We'll pick it up at verse 10. Because of all the people I can study in the scripture uh, 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 that were pastor-like ones, you know, obviously Jesus was everything. But of all the pastors that I can find, pastor prophets, I'd have to say Moses may have walked with God closer than anybody we can find. At least we're given more information about Moses, right? Moses spoke with God face to face as a man speaks to his friend. That's that's pretty good business. Moses, when Moses wanted to cross the Red Sea, God opened it up so he could go through on dry ground. He didn't need a boat or anything. He just went through. This guy's got something going on. Moses Church, right? I always feel bad for Joshua. Moses Church, he's got, he's got bread falling out of the sky. He's got a cloud of fire at night to keep everybody warm. And when God tells Joshua, you're the next pastor, I would be thinking, great. How do you follow this act, right? You better, if you're going to pastor this church, you better bring your A game. These people are used to a few miracles. In fact, if you sassed Moses like Korah did, God, the Bible says that God opened up the ground and Korah went to hell alive. Now, I don't think going to hell dead is any better, but certainly he was making a point. We're not even going to let you die. We're just going to get rid of you right now, right? That's Pastor Moses. 
and he's gone through all of these things. But here we pick it up in Numbers chapter 11 when Moses has, has got this church and he's got it out in the wilderness and they're on their way to the promised land. Look at verse 10 here, Numbers chapter 11. It says this, And Moses heard the people weeping throughout their families, everyone at the door of his tent. They're not even doing this inside in the kitchen, right? They're just on their front porch. Everybody's weeping. And the anger of the Lord was greatly aroused. So look at these three different, you know, individuals. The people are weeping. And the anger of the Lord was greatly aroused. So God's not happy. The people aren't happy. And in verse 11, it says, it says this, sorry, it says, and Moses also was displeased. So the people aren't happy. God's not happy. And the pastor's not happy. My God, we're having revival, huh? Woo, don't you want to go become a member of Moses First Church? Now, we don't think of them like that, but that is like that. That's how they were in their day. So let's read on. So Moses said to the Lord, so we're going to get a private view of what Moses is praying in his private prayer time, right? This guy walks with God. So he's in prayer and the Bible records for us what it is he's praying. Verse 11. So Moses said to the Lord, why have you afflicted your servant? <laughs> God, why, why have you attacked me? What did I do wrong? Amen. And why have I not found favor in your sight? In other words, what did I do wrong? Where's my sin? that you have laid the burden of all these people on me. Did I conceive all these people? Did, these aren't my kids. Did I beget them as you should say to me, carry them in your bosom as a guardian carries a nursing child to the land which you swore to their fathers? You know what he's doing? He's saying to God, hey, this wasn't my idea. I didn't say, Lee, I didn't say go through the wilderness. I didn't promise them all this stuff. Now they need all these things. I ain't got this meat. They're going crazy. They want meat. I don't know. Maybe they're ready for some ribs or something, but they can't They can't get anything. I shouldn't say ribs. They weren't allowed to eat pork. I always feel kind of bad for the Old Testament people, right? No pork, no shrimp, no lobster. That's hard days. Hallelujah. Anyways, on to another part of the sermon. 13, where am I to get meat to give all these people that they weep all over me saying, give us meat that we may eat? 14, here you go. You ready? You should underline this in your Bible. I am not able to bear all these people alone because the burden is too heavy for me. I'm going to read the next verse and then we'll pick this back up. Look at 15. If you treat me like this, please kill me here and now. Did I, I read that in your Bible? Is that what your Bible says? Because that's what my Bible says. This, this, please kill God if you're going to make, just kill me. If I have found favor in your sight, then do not let me see my wretchedness. We're not going to ask Pastor Bill for an opinion. We don't want to know what if he's ever prayed this prayer. But let me help you something. This is bad news, right? This pastor is saying, I'd rather die than go pastor that church. Just kill me. I don't care. I don't want to do this anymore. I mean, he's not just quitting. He's suicidal. Again, we're not asking pastor. We don't care what pastor says. Don't even look at him on the video, right? But this is Moses. This is the this is the sea splitter. Think about this for just a minute. Pharaoh never brought him to his knees like this. The ten plagues never broke this man down. The Red Sea, Pharaoh's army, they never wore this man out to this extent. But the care of the people did. Trying to help God's people make their way not just to through the, the uh, wilderness, but into the promised land and ultimately to heaven and trying to get them to be spiritual and to take God at his word, it breaks this man down to where he's literally saying, God, I'd rather die than keep doing this. Now, I don't want to say God's got a problem, but if we can put it that way, God's got a problem because this is his number one pastor who knows him better than any person on the earth in the middle of one of the greatest moves of God, and he is wore down so far that he doesn't want to go on. So God gives him the wisest answer he can possibly give this man of God in order to help him through this situation. Are you with me? I've always said it this way. If there was a better answer, God would have given him the other answer. Do you ever, you and I, you know, we learn knowledge. It accumulates over your lifetime. God's not that way. He's just always known everything. He's never learned anything. He's never not known it. What would he learn? That'll kind of cook your noodle a little bit later on. You can think about that. Hallelujah. 
But God gives him the beginning of what I call the ministry of helps. We'll pick it up here in Numbers 11, 16. This is God's answer to this desperate pastor. So the Lord said to Moses, gather to me 70 men of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be elders of the people and officers over them, and bring them to the tabernacle, that's the church, of meeting, tabernacle of meeting, that they may stand there with you. You should underline or circle the word with you, not in charge of the pastor, not behind the pastor, but come alongside of the pastor. Look at, look at the next verse 17. Then I will come down and I will talk with you there. That's my, that's my favorite part. And I will take of the spirit that is upon him and I'll put that same spirit upon you that they, or upon the people that they may bear the burden of the people with you that you may not bear it yourself alone. So what's God's answer to this Moses, this pastor? It's not, it's not a bigger church. He doesn't say, Moses, if you just had a bigger church, everything would be okay. You know, we know that scripturally there were 600,000 men that came out of Egypt. Every one of them having a wife, that's, that's 1.2 million. A couple of kids, you're at 1.8 million easily. So you're bumping 2 million people pretty conservatively. God didn't tell him he needed a bigger church. God didn't tell him he needed more money. Moses, if you had a better sound system, Moses, if you had more gold, if you just had this, that, and the other, you know, you'd be able to get everything done. He says, what's missing here is the anointing, not on you, Moses, but on the people. They're not bad people, but until your spirit, that anointing that I put on you also gets on them, they can't help you bear the burden of the people together. They, they're not anointed for that. They've got to get your heart. They've got to get that anointing in them in order to really make this go. Can you say amen? Let me give you a um, couple of examples. You know, um, most of you that know me or if you read up about me, you know, I've been with Dr. Barclay since 1987. I found him as my pastor and I've been serving in the church. I worked for him for a period of about 13 years. My wife, Janine, has always worked in the nursery, sometimes in charge, sometimes different things, but always had a role working in the nursery, right? So I'm working in the office and I'm working for Dr. Barkley. He calls me one day and he says, um, he said, look, I've, I think he gave away his computer to a missionary that was just like him. He said, but I'm leaving tomorrow on a flight. Back then he was flying commercial. He didn't have his own plane. He said, I'm leaving on a flight tomorrow and I'm flying out to California to preach. So what I want you to do, Ray, call the shop where we get all of our computers from, have it overnighted. So I have it first thing in the morning. Then I've downloaded all my information. I can upload it onto the new computer and I can be working while I'm sitting on the plane for four hours on my way to the West Coast. And, and I'm not wasting my, my time. I have too many things to do. He said, no problem. Well, this is like quarter to five on that, on that day. So I call the shop and I, I work with them and they said, yep, we've got the computer, the right memory, the right processing, all that happy stuff. Right. And I said, OK, we'll box it up. I need it for first thing in the morning. They said, well, we can't get it out today. I said, I don't understand why you have the computer. Yeah, we do. But short answer is we don't have it here at this store. Our shipping is done in another location. They've already gone home for the day. The computers aren't in this part of the of the corporation. So it's, it was almost five o'clock, right? At that point, it's too late in the day. So I go to hang up the phone when I'm working in the office. And as I hang up the phone, the Holy Spirit speaks to me. He says, you know, it's only quarter to two in California. You know, I never thought about that because I'm Michigan based, right? So Eastern time zone. So I hopped online real quick and I found a computer store, but on the West Coast that had the exact same computer, everything's the same processor memory, all that happy stuff. And I ordered, and I said, can you send it out yet today? They said, yeah, that's fine. No, no problem. You'll have it for first thing tomorrow morning. Hang up the phone and no sooner do I hang up the phone with that second company and the phone on my desk rings and it's Pastor Barclay wanting to know about the computer. He said, did you get me that computer originally from New York? I said, I said, no. He said, I need a computer. I said, yes, sir. I've got your computer. He said, well, so New York is sending it. I said, no, New York isn't sending it. I was kind of wanting to say it's like the old who's on first routine. 
Pastor, if you can just slow down for just a second. I, I've got this covered, but I couldn't get him to slow down to talk to him. He said, I need that computer. I said, you've got that computer. He said, from New York? I said, no, it's too late to get him out of New York. He said, well, what are you doing? I said, I've got a computer coming from California because it's three hours time delay. They could still get it out. We'll still have it. UPS, FedEx will still have it here first thing in the morning. He said, let me get this straight. You've got a computer coming from California. So when I fly from Michigan to California, I can use the computer. I said, that's what I've been trying to tell you all this time, right? So he, he stops and he says, Ray, he says, that's the coolest thing I've ever heard. I said, I'm pretty impressed myself. You know, I didn't, I never even knew I could do that. But I hung up the phone and I began to realize that God didn't want to just anoint pastor to preach. He anointed me to help him preach. That's what I want to talk to you about today. When I was a kid, I used to love to play baseball, right? My dad was, um, was a farmer. Uh, after World War II, he became an airplane mechanic, settled into the greater Detroit area, and worked for General Motors Corporation. But dad would play baseball growing up, even on the farm, and he taught me how to pitch. And I always loved, like all boys, you love to be with your dad, right? So I pitched. I pitched growing up all the time whenever he wasn't working me half to death. You know, the old timers, that's what they all did. And um, so we we worked all the time and then he'd teach me to pitch. And when he would go to work, I built a backstop, my brother and I in the backyard, and I would pitch all the time. But I would get on these terrible teams, just these losing teams. They used to have a... Um, a forfeit rule, you know, if you were behind by more, more than 10 runs going into the fifth inning, you know, you would get a mercy rule, they called it. Sorry. You would get mercy. You'd get sent home, you know, just on mercy. Well, we, we would get mercy and, and I'm the pitcher, right? So I'm going home from this game and I'm feeling pretty down about myself. I'm looking at the stats and I'm walking along and I realized looking at these stats, there was only four hits in the whole game and we lost 17 to two. And I'm thinking to myself, man, I must really stink as, as a pitcher. I, I, I'm terrible. But I'm starting to realize, hey, there's only four hits here. And about that time, this car pulls up and this guy by the name of Schmidt, Mr. Schmidt was his name. He looks at me and I, I'm, you know, I'm 14 years old or so walking along, pushing my bike and looking at these stats. And he says, uh, he says, hey, you, he said, uh, you Ray Bench? And I said, yeah, I'm Ray Bench. Why? He said, you pitch? I said, yeah, I pitch. He said, I'm starting a team. You want to pitch for me? I thought, well, you should see who I'm pitching for now. I'll pitch for anybody. I just love to pitch. No problem. He said, um, you call me in a couple of days. Gave me, gave me his card. He said, I'm forming a team and I'll give you the instructions. So a couple of weeks went by, maybe a month, and, and we practiced a little bit. And I'm out there on the first, on the first game. First inning, I think it's the first guy up for bat, right? And this guy hits a slow ground ball towards my shortstop. I'll never forget it a day in my life. He hits a slow ground ball towards my shortstop. And I'm thinking, okay, well, that's probably going to go through his legs or he's going to miss it or overthrow first base or something. But he doesn't. Before the, for the, the shortstop can catch the ball. My third baseman runs over in front of him, and we used to say, cut him off. He caught the ball first, and he grabs the ball, and he throws it over to first base, which put it right by my earlobe. I can still hear it to this day. The strings, you know, going by my ear, and it comes by, and it goes over to first base, and the umpire yells, you're out, and everybody's throwing the ball around and kind of rejoicing, and I'm sitting there on pitcher's mound, and I'm looking all around, and I think to myself, there's eight other people out here. Where did these eight other people come from? When did they show up on the field? Where, where have they been? Do you know we went on that season? Now, I'm a 14-year-old kid, right? We went on that season and we won the city championship, never lost the game. Me and another guy, we traded off pitching. I didn't pitch every game. And at the end of the season, I pitched a championship game. The coach comes out and he gives me the game ball. And I'm standing there with the coach and the ump. And they look at me and they say, Ray, that's the best pitching I've ever seen in my life. And even as a kid, Pastor Bill, even as a kid, I'm sitting there thinking, 17 to 2. 
It was just a few weeks ago I lost 17 to 2. Now I'm being told this is the best pitching they've ever seen in their life. What's what's changed? What's different? Because I'm not throwing different pitches. I'm not doing anything different. The difference is those eight other guys. Those eight other guys were as serious about baseball as I was. Just like I was home throwing the ball at the wall and catching it, I found out they were home doing the same thing. Guys would skip going pitching or fishing with their dads in order to come practice, not just to the games, to come practice. We loved baseball. We ate it up. You couldn't, you couldn't practice us too much. You couldn't make us work too hard. We, we didn't like baseball. We loved baseball. But as hard as I worked and as much as I practiced, it never mattered until I found a team of people that were serious about this as what I was. Here's an illustration. I was in the office one day again working for Dr. Barclay and this pastor's wife calls me and she says, you know, she said, Brother Ray, she said, well, I want to thank you for having your wife work in the nursery. So, well, why would you thank me for that? You know, number one, I don't make my wife work in the nursery. I'm not that crazy. I didn't say, Janine, you have to go work in the nursery. I've always saluted her because for a season we had to have a daycare in our home. And even though she was with 12 kids from 730 in the morning until 530, she would still come clean up, get dressed for church, head to church, and then go volunteer to work in the nursery for another hour, two hours. Some nights if we had a conference, it was three or four hours but she always did her part to help bless those kids. So I told this pastor's wife, I said, well, I'm glad that my wife is helpful, but why would you notice that? I mean, you got a million things to do. She told me this story, that's why I'm telling you. She said, you know, Brother Ray, she said, our church hasn't been doing very well. We, I said, well, that's, that's horrible. I said, you're good people, you teach a good message. She said, yeah, she said, but our attendance is really down, things aren't going well. We've been thinking about closing it up. I said, well, what does that have to do with my wife working in the nursery? She said, you know, we were praying over shutting it down. And just as I was, we were getting ready to come to one of the conferences that Dr. Barclay does and believe in God for a prophetic word. And she said, in the middle of all of that, she said, we're getting ready to come, not come. And I told my husband, I'm not going. Our son was, wasn't feeling well and he gets fussy. I'm going to drive two, three hours to church. And when we get there, I'm not going to be able to leave him in the nursery because he's fussy. So I'm going to have to come out and hold him. And it's just, I, I'm not going if I got to live like that. And just as I'm getting ready to tell my husband we're not coming at that time, the Lord reminds me about your wife working in the nursery. I, I was shocked. I said, you're kidding me. She said, nope. She said to her husband, she said, you go believe in God that, that brother, that, Brother Barkley will be in the prophet's office and we get a prophetic word. I'm going to go believing that Janine Bench is working in the nursery, right? These are her words, not mine. And because Janine is as serious in the nursery as pastor is working out there in the, in the pulpit. And if, if Dr. Barclay is in the prophet's office and Janine is in the nursery, game on, God will minister for us. She said, we got to church and I look and I see your wife starting to make her way for the nursery after prayer time closed. And I knew God would work for us. And that day, as soon as the worship was over, pastor stood up, took the pulpit and said to the two of us, you come out in the aisle and he had a prophetic word. He said, and you don't close the doors of your church. You'll see God is going to replenish those troops of yours that you've lost. You stand and see the salvation of your guard, of your God. And she said to me on the phone, she said, Brother Ray, from now on, every, every person we get saved, every missionary we help, every person we touch in our area, your wife is gonna get a reward in heaven because we would have closed down the church if she hadn't been so faithful to the nursery. And I thought about my, my baseball story, Pastor Bill. I thought about how hard I had worked, but I didn't have any fruit. And I thought to myself, you know, every pastor's like that. They can study and they can pray and they can fast all night, but if the people around them aren't serious about what we're doing, the people at the music or the people with the nurseries or the people in the parking lot were gossiping or we don't care or we're, we're uninformed or we haven't done our due diligence or we don't have this anointing on us like Moses people, we're not helping bring the vision to pass. 
we're in the church, we love the church, but we're really not driving this thing forward the way that we could. And it dawned on me how dependent my pastor was on a nursery worker. It dawned on me that day working in the office how much pastor was depending on me being in my gift and in my anointing. And I wanna, I wanna close with that. That's, you know, been my heart for all this time. But you can study one more verse on your own. Uh, in, uh, in 2 Samuel, Samuel chapter, chapter 23, 23, verses 14, 14 through 17, 17 David, David says this, and David has his mighty men, right? right? So, so David, David isn't a one-man one show either. David, David says, I wish I had a drink of water from the well of Bethlehem. That's, 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 that's really, really good drinking water. water. David was raised in Bethlehem, but the Philistines had overrun the city. The Bible says, and David's three mighty men, when they heard that, they, they broke, broke through, through that, that night. They, they broke, broke through the Philistine camp or day or whatever it was. And they, they got, got the water from the well and then they, they broke back through the guards and took it to David. The anointing came on them not to be king, but to help David become king. It wasn't that God said, no, just David. He's going to be the only one I'll ever use and he's the only one I'll anoint. Even David had to have people around him who were anointed and serious about what they were doing. Jesus had his 12. Elijah had Elijah, Elisha. Moses had Joshua, Aaron, and Hur. Abraham eventually had Isaac. You can't find anybody in the Bible that was, quote, a one-man show. Even John the Baptist had his disciples around him. Jesus had to have people rowing through the night. You know, we, we have to learn that it isn't just about one person building the church. Every person has an anointing that God wants to put on them to build that local church. And whether you're the singers, the psalmists, as we saw today, flowing in that anointing, it's precious, it's beautiful. I can't, I can't do that. But if the pastor has to do everything, eventually you'll wear him down because nobody is called to do it all. And as the church grows, more and more people have to take their role with giving and the parking lot and the, the door and the heating systems and all of these things take dedicated men and women of God who flow in their anointing. Amen. Well, I'm going to wrap up. I'm going to pray and then turn this back over to pastor and um, just study these verses if you would on your own. If I was there, I'd anoint you and lay hands on all of you. I really feel like right now we're helping some people today. Amen. So um, let me pray for you, and then, Pastor, I'll turn the service back over to you. Heavenly Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus for the anointing of your Holy Spirit, that you give gifts unto all men. Only some are called to what we call the fivefold ministry, but all of us are set in the body. The scriptures bear this out. All of us have a place in the body. All of us, Lord Jesus, have something that you've put in us for the church. Lord, help us to stir up the gifts of God now. May your in, anointing increase on all of our lives that we might come alongside of our pastor to build this church, Cornerstone Community, for the strength and for the glory of the Almighty God that we might touch our surrounding area with your power and your name. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. amen. God, God bless you, Pastor. You. Thank you for this time. It's, it's been a pleasure. pleasure. Amen, amen, amen. Wow, what a powerful and anointed word from the Holy Ghost this morning through our brother Ray Bench. Listen, I want to encourage you <clears throat> uh, to go over to Ray's website, raybench.com, and check out all the wonderful resources that he has available. Uh, there's a way to bless him. Of course, go to his Facebook page, like him, follow him uh, on there as well. There's some, uh, this guy is a gift to the body of Christ with multiple resources available to help you be all that you're called to be. Now, with that being said, now I know, forgive me if, if this is not what you want to say, Ray, but um, you know he was sharing with me that he had 10 or 12 meetings that had canceled on him over all this stuff with this corona stuff. Um, so obviously that impacts his income. So obviously we're going to send him a love offering. I would, I would like to kind of take up a second offering, so to speak, if I could. You know, go to our website. Uh, go to the Church Center app that you've all installed. You can text to give at 8 four three two one just put in the amount and send it to eight four three two one um, anything that comes in today that's marked offering we're going to say send that directly to him and we just want to be a blessing to him so if you have the ability 
uh, to bless him and you want to sow further into this ministry, you receive something today, hey, let's not be, let's not be freeloaders, so to speak. You got something today. I know you did. I did for sure. So let's, let's do our best to sow into this ministry that fed us today. Amen. Listen, we've already prayed. And so we call you blessed. We hope you receive something today. And as always, we're stronger together.